The subject of marriage is a difficult one in our time. It's difficult because the devil is winning big time in the area of marriage in our country. So it's difficult to talk about because it's a great spiritual battle. And the devil likes it that way. He prefers to keep things a difficult subject so that we won't talk about it. And that way he can keep winning. But in the Bible, God calls preachers to preach about the difficult things. To not be afraid of the difficult subjects. Because it is actually the way that we take back the ground from the devil is when we preach the truth. As we tell people the truth. Whenever we talk about marriage, it's very important that we understand that just like any other sin that can be committed by mankind, Jesus Christ has made a complete and full payment for all sin. There's a complete and total forgiveness for all sin. And all God requires you, me, or anyone else to do at the point in our lives where we recognize that we failed in some area is simply to ask forgiveness and move on. And God says the past is over and forgiven and he never brings it up again. He doesn't say go and be guilt, feel guilty some more. It's just go and sin no more. So that's a very important thing to bring up. But I want to say that today this message, the message about marriage, is not only for married people. It is for unmarried people as well. And the reason is because we need to understand as a church what God says in his word about marriage. And then single people need to know how to counsel married people regarding marriage because very often single people will not give married people good counsel. And then also single people themselves will often will get married someday and they need that foundation. And children need to understand what they're getting into before they get into marriage. They need to understand the very solemn vow and the very solemn promise they're making before God and man when they get married. And so this is not a message that's just only for married people. It's a message for all of us that we as a congregation would uphold exactly what God says in his word. Nothing more and nothing less than what God teaches. There are extremes on the subject of marriage, even among conservative Bible-believing Christians. And there are extremes of teaching that usually either take away from God's word or add to God's word. This morning, I don't even want to address or go into those extremes. All I want to do, by God's grace, is give to you straight from the Word of God what God says about marriage. That's my goal. I want to ask you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. And I'm going to read, read verses 21 through 22. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Verses 21 through 22. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. Just keep your finger in Deuteronomy 24. I ask you to turn over to Ecclesiastes 5, where a very similar statement is made. Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. When thou vowest a vow unto God, Defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast found. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So if you kept your finger in Deuteronomy 23... Verse 21, he says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. 
and then back Ecclesiastes 5, 4 through 5. When thou vowest a vow unto the Lord thy God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Young people, it's not a sin to choose not to marry. It's not a sin to say, I'm not going to vow that vow. You can choose not to get married, and it won't be a sin. That's what God says right here in his word. If you defer to vow, it won't be a sin. But if you vow, you better pay what you vowed. If you're single, you can decide not to get married. That's not a sin. You defer not to vow, you can defer to vow, and you can say, I'm not going to make that vow. I don't know. I'm worried. I'm not, I'm not sure I can keep it. I don't keep it. But God says in his holy word, if you make a vow, you better keep your vow. You better keep your vow. And that is the title of the message today, Pay Your Vows. Pay Your Vows. Heavenly Father, I pray that you are filled with your spirit as I preach. Father, I don't want the meaning of this message to be lost. Father, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Father, none of us measure up to your holy word. But you warn us in your word about keeping your word and about keeping our word for a reason because there are devastating consequences when we do not keep our word and we do not follow your word. So, Father, may this not be a message of condemnation, but, Father, may it be a message of challenge to all of us that we will say from this point in our lives into the future that whatever vows that we have made at this point in our lives on April 28th, 2019, from now to the day that I die, whatever vows I have made that I am able to keep, I will keep those vows. I pray that we would all commit to that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn to Matthew chapter 19. We'll be looking at a lot of scripture today, and it's important because this is a subject that there's a lot of confusion about. So we do need to look at a lot of scripture. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Uh, let me start with verse 3. Verses 3 through 6. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And I just want to pause and say here that is exactly the way a pastor feels, feel, fear, fears too, but feels in America today, is that people always come up to a pastor and they always ask him questions about marriage, and they're tempting him. Because they view the marriage issue as a matter of opinion, and they want to know what the pastor's opinion is. And they want to actually figure out a way to, to twist the scripture to make it say what they want to say, justify what they've already decided they want to do. And that is exactly what the rabbis did, and it's exactly what the Pharisees did, and it's exactly what the Pharisees are doing to Jesus right here. And Jesus points them to the Word of God. That's what he does. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now I know there's more in this passage. And I'm not going to go into that because I don't have time today for it. Because I have a very specific purpose and point in the message. And that is, pay your vows. Pay your vows. That's the message. All right? So we'll go into all of that. You've heard me. I've given lots of teachings on divorce and remarriage and marriage and the Bible. Um, I, I've done it in many Sunday school lessons. I've touched on it in messages. But this morning, there's one simple thing I want you to remember. Come Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when you don't really remember anything the pastor said, although you can't go back and see it on YouTube if you want to remember it. 
I hope you remember this. Three words. Pay your vows. Pay your vows. Pay your vows. So the Pharisees asked a question. Can a man um, put away his wife for every cause? And he said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That was his answer. He said, God made them male and female. And he said, they're not two anymore. They're one flesh. And he says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. I want you to understand that in this passage, he is saying that God joined you together if you entered into a marriage and became one flesh. Very often people will try to say, well, I don't really believe that God joined us together. That's mm -hmm. not true. Because in this passage, he says, if a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and they're one flesh, then God joined them together. I want you to understand that when a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and they're one flesh, when a man and a woman make a commitment to be lived together in a marriage relationship, the Bible says God has joined them together. Saved, unsaved, no difference. There was not even a context of this passage. All he says is, when a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and they become one flesh, God has joined them together. That's the point. And Jesus said, if God joined you together, you can't put it asunder. Let not man put asunder. Now I want to ask you to turn to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Again, I want to repeat that just like this commandment in the Bible gets violated today, every commandment in the Bible gets violated by people. All right? So when we sin, God forgives us our sin when we ask him for forgiveness. All right? So what we're establishing here is what God commands. We are acknowledging and understanding that man falls short of God's commands. We understand that as a church, we accept that every one of us has violated God's commands at some point in our life, okay? So this is not about condemnation, but it is about clarifying something, folks, that the devil has muddied the water so much on, and in the subject of marriage is so confused nowadays, and so can even among Christians, even Bible-believing Christians, who take a strong stand against same-sex marriage, are themselves violating what God commands clearly about marriage when it comes to opposite-gender marriage in the church. That's the issue. And so all we're doing today is we're not condemning anyone for sin or for failures because we all sin, we all fail. But all we're doing today is we have to actually establish what God said. Don't we? When a, a man commits adultery, all right, he knows God said don't commit adultery. And he has to ask forgiveness when he commits adultery, right? When someone steals, they know that God said don't steal. And so they know it's a sin, and they ask God to forgive them for stealing, correct? All those the different sins in the Bible, there's forgiveness for them, right? There may be legal consequences. You may have to spend time in prison for committing murder or may even be executed for murder. There are human consequences, but we're talking about what does God command. And folks, what we need to get back to as Christians is understanding what God has actually commanded regarding marriage. Because today, we're questioning everything God commanded. And I'm talking about in Bible-believing churches, we are actually often questioning what God commanded. Now, we need to know what God commanded. We can say that when you break God's commandments, forgiveness, yes. But we have to understand and clarify, what has God commanded? And here's what God has commanded. Pay your vows. Pay your vows. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, and with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. The prophet Malachi was pro prophesying most likely during the time of Nehemiah when there was a, a real need for revival and a transformation because they had come back from Babylon and they had built the temple and they were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and they were trying to serve God again, but because they had sinned for so many years, they had to go back and learn what God said. And one of the things that the prophet Malachi tells them is, he says, you're spending all this time offering sacrifices and weeping and praying and God's not blessing you and he's not answering your prayers. And he says this in verse 14, Yet ye say, wherefore? Say, why? Why is God not hearing our prayers? Why is God not sending your time? Why is God not doing the things we want him to do? And here is Malachi's answer. Wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt 
treacherously. God said to the men that they had committed treason against their wives. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. I want you to understand what a covenant is. A covenant is a vow. It's a promise. Till death do us part. That's what a covenant is. And God says, you committed treason against your wife because she, you made a covenant with her when you married her. You left your father and mother, you joined your wife, became one flesh, and you made a covenant. You made a vow, and now you're breaking your vow. And it's there's no difference between that and God's sight as we would look at someone who made a vow to uphold the Constitution and defend their country and defected to the enemy. That is exactly how God views it. I want you to understand it says, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. And did not he make one, right? God made them one, right? The two shall become one, we just read. And yet had he the residue of the spirit. And that's referring to the fact that God breathed the breath. The word spirit means breath. God breathed his spirit into Adam when he made them. And wherefore one? Why did God make you one? Now I want to pause here and say this. Why did God make you one? Why did God create marriage? What is the purpose God has for marriage? It says this, that he might seek a godly seed. Do you know he didn't make marriage to make you happy? He made marriage so that you would have godly seed. Do you know he didn't make marriage so that um, uh, all of your dreams could be fulfilled? He made marriage because he was seeking a godly seed. Now I understand some people can't have children. Some people get married when they're past the age of having children. And it is perfectly fine for you to enjoy companionship with your spouse. But the primary purpose of marriage is a godly seed. Let me tell you something. If you're not paying your vows, what are the chances that you're going to have a godly seed? Very, very small. If you are not paying your vows, if you are not fulfilling the vows that you made, very small chance you will have a godly seed. And God's looking for a godly seed. You're looking for happiness. He's looking for a godly seed. By the way, that applies to those of you who are married and your children are grown. Because do you know how devastating it is to 30 and 40 year old children when their parents get divorced? Because what they are seeing is everything their parents taught them for the past three, four decades completely being thrown out the window. And do you think that makes them want to be faithful in their own marriages when they're in their 30s and 40s when you throw yours away? It doesn't at all. And so you are destroying the God we see even if you get divorced many years later. You're destroying the God we see. Again, what are we talking about here? All sin is forgiven by God. You ask God forgives, he'll forgive you. And, and uh, I have committed sins. You've all committed sins that are devastating. But what I'm clarifying here is what God commands and what his purpose is, what his intention is. That's what we got to get a hold of. We can all receive forgiveness for any mistakes we've made in the past. But we do have to actually understand and establish what God has commanded. Let me ask you a question. Have people been committing murder for thousands of years? Yes. Since when do we say, so we don't want to make the murderers feel bad, so we'll change the rule and say it's okay to commit murder? Have people been committing adultery for thousands of years? Since when do we say we don't want to make the adulterers feel bad, so we change the rules for adultery? Folks, have people been getting divorced for thousands of years? Yes. Since when do we say we don't want to make the divorced people feel bad, so let's change the rules on divorce? Amen. We have to establish God's word. Amen. And every time I sin, I need to ask forgiveness. Every time you sin, you ask forgiveness. And we should never, as a church, condemn someone else for failure. Sure. But we should never, ever water down the Word of God right. because what we're doing when we're trying to make the people who have failed feel better is we're causing other people to fail in the process. And that's what the devil wants. And folks, at Bell's Baptist Church, we're not going to allow that. And I know it's not just me. I know Bell's Baptist Church, the people in the congregation believe this as well. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. And we believe that we need to preach all of it from Genesis to Revelation. And when the Bible, when the Bible says, pay your vows, you got to pay our vows. That's what we're going to do. From this day forward, we're going to make a commitment. We're going to pay our vows. From this day forward, just like the song said, just like the, the vows say, from this day forward. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hated putting away. Now I want to say something about independent fundamental Baptist churches. I am an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know what that means. Independent means the highest authority is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ is in charge of the church. By the way, do you know I'm not in charge of the church? Jesus Christ is in charge of the church. 
he rules his church through his word. Now, he's given me the job of preaching the word, but he's the one that's actually ruling through the word. So every church is under the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, the pastor is in the midst of them. No. no. He said, where two or three are gathered in my, gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. But he did tell the first pastor, Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So he told me to feed his sheep, but he said this. The pastor of Delta, feed the sheep. But here's what he did say. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You know what that means? That means, independent means, that each church doesn't answer to another church or any authority outside the church. Jesus Christ is right in the middle of each church. There am I in the midst of them, and he rules his church. Amen. That's what independent means, all right? I'm, not, I'm just explaining what I mean when I say independent, fundamental Baptist church, okay? So it doesn't matter. You can use a totally different word as long as you meant the same thing and still be biblical, all right? But independent means Jesus Christ is, in fact, actually, truthfully, through his word, in charge of this church. That's what independent means. Fundamental means you believe the whole Bible is true. That's all fundamental. Fundamental means the foundation, the foundation of our faith. Everything we believe is God's inspired, inerrant, infallible word. Amen. All right? And so that's what fundamental means. So don't be scared of those words. The media will twist them all, make it be like we're some crazy snake handling cult. But we're not. Especially not the snake handling part. No, not cult. <laughs> but we're just simple Bible-leading Christians who say that Jesus Christ is in charge of this church because the Bible says he is. And he rules the church through his word, and Jesus' word is fundamental means the foundation is God's truth and his holy word, and that's what we believe. We believe the whole Bible. So independent means Jesus Christ is in charge of the local church. Fundamental means the Bible is all true, and Baptist means you believe that the Bible, biblical model for baptism is believer's baptism by immersion, which means in the Bible, a person made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, and then he said, then I can baptize you. And he baptizes. It means you make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and then we baptize you. Not the other way around. We don't baptize you when you're a baby or sprinkling you in a baby. And also baptize means to immerse. So immersing someone in water after a profession of faith, that's what baptism means. All right. Now that I've clarified, so we don't be scared of that term. I am an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. Now you know what it means. But folks, we have a problem in independent fundamental Baptist churches. Because in independent fundamental Baptist churches, if you say God hates sodomy, you'll get a big amen. If you say God hates homosexuality, it's a sin, it's wrong. Now, in all fairness, independent fundamental Baptist churches are the are the, the strongest on soul winning. So they'll go after people living a lesbian homosexual lifestyle and share the gospel with them. They will show them love. So in all fairness, they're really not the hate speech people. Because even though they preach it's a sin, just like I'm preaching divorce is a sin today, just like they're preaching that it's a sin, they will go after those people and show them love and share the gospel. And there are many born-again Christians in independent fundamental Baptist churches that used to practice a lifestyle of homosexuality and lesbianism and all the other cues and all the other things you brought in the truth. <laughs> all right? But here's the problem. There aren't that many people who are practicing homosexuality and lesbianism in the average independent fundamental congregation. But there are a lot of people who are either divorced, about to commit, about to have a divorce, or who believe divorce is okay. And God says, not only in his word that he hates the sin of homosexuality, but he also says that he hates divorce. Right. And folks, when God says he hates one sin, and there's a lot of it in the average church, and then he says he hates another sin, and there's very little of it in the church, and you spend all your time harping on the sin that isn't even very much in the church, and you completely ignore the one that's there, folks, as pastors, we need to go look in the mirror. When you say, what are we doing? We are just like preaching for amens. Because all the people who have been divorced, remarried several times, would love to say, amen, preach it, when they talk about sodomy. But they're not going to say as much. Amen. Preach it. And there's a saying, you know, you'll say amen to the pastor starts following your coin. <laughs> then all of a sudden you're quiet. It's true. Now here's what I'm saying. Because you know that I am not someone who wants you to go home and feel guilty about any area that you fail. You know I don't want you to do that. And I have failed many times. And I struggle with guilt myself. Not going to go down the list of all the things that I feel guilty about now from my past. But I have plenty. Trust me. I'm human. And I have plenty of things I regret from my past. But that's not my goal. But my goal is simply to say this, folks. When the devil is winning and having a heyday in the area of marriage in Bible-believing churches, we need to get back to 
preaching what he, God says is wrong in Bible in churches because that's one of the reasons is that people aren't really sure it's really wrong and they have all these excuses that they're making for why in some situations it's okay and that's where, it's, where, that's where the devil gets a little inroad. He comes in and it becomes a cancer that destroys all the families in the church and all the marriages in the church. So we've got to get back to that. Got to get back to talking about what the Lord hates. And not, there are many things the Bible says he hates, but especially when it's something that is a real problem among Bible believing Christians, we got to get back to saying, This is a sin. God hates it. The Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hated putting away. And that word putting away, that phrase means divorce, to put away your spouse, okay? For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. And what that's saying is this is basically you are committing violence to God's people and to your own family when you get a divorce or when you uh, think that divorce is okay. And so he says, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. You are causing damage to, um, to God's people when you deal treacherously and when you don't pay your vows. So pay your vows. Now, what were the vows? We just sang them. Um, and um, um, I have to tell you something. I really disagree with the most common practice of marriage nowadays um, in the church is that when you have a marriage ceremony, the pastor says, repeat after me. I disagree with that. Because I think if you are going to make a vow and a promise that literally is affecting the rest of your life, you probably ought to memorize that. You probably ought to know. I mean, you're memorizing John 16, the Romans wrote all these, not John 16, John 3, 16, the Romans wrote all these things we memorize in the Bible and it's like the most serious commitment you're making in your life after salvation, and you're just going to repeat after the pastor, and then like five minutes later, you don't remember what you said. Folks, we ought to be memorizing our wedding vows. I do think we have to. All right. So the wedding vows, obviously I memorized mine. That's why I say that, but I really believe that's important. So wedding vows, what are the vows that you made? Now I had a lady <coughs> say to me one time, well, the vows are man-made. And I thought, oh, I got to think about that. Are the vows man-made? Well, then when I went back and looked at those vows, I said, well, well, the exact wording, yeah, as comes so the exact wording is not, it doesn't matter if you say the wording exactly the way everybody else, and there are different variations in the wording. Not No one wedding ceremony is exactly the same. But I said, no, but what the vows are saying are not man-made at all. What the vows are saying are 100% representing biblical truth. So I want to uh, talk to you about what you vowed when you made the wedding vows, and some of you, it will be what you will vow someday if you make wedding vows. Pay your vows. Genesis chapter 2, please. And the first thing you said was this, for better. The vast majority of you, unless you had a highly creative wedding, the vast majority of you said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for love and to serve, for them he was part the vast majority of you said that. I know that's what I said in my wedding, and I can remember even though it was 19 years ago. So the, the vast majority of you said this, this is what you vowed, and we're talking about paying your vows, all right? So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about what you vowed. I want to talk to you about paying now. It's time to pay up. This is what you said. This is what you promised. You looked into her eyes. You looked in his, to his dazzling eyes, and you said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death, not divorce, till death. He was born. And now it's time to go back over what you said and pay your vows. Pay your vows. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. This is for better. It's before sin, right? So it was definitely for better. <laughs> Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him unhealth, meet for him. You notice God said it's not good for man to be alone. What does that mean if it's not good and then he's going to fix the problem? Does that mean it's for better? Yeah. For when he was single, it wasn't for better. But when he got married, it was for better. Folks, remember this. I don't care how long you've been married. I don't care how many problems you have now. God says it was better for you to get married. Yeah. For better. It's not good that the man should be alone. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in health meat for him. All right, he's still waiting for the better. 
And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and took one of his ribs and closed the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. And in Hebrew, it's she shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That's the foundational passage for marriage in the Bible. A man leaves his father and his mother and shall be cleave, cleave unto his wife. That's the gender you had at birth, just clarifying and they shall be one flesh. All right, that's for better. So folks, I want you to understand that when you first get married, the vast majority of people, unless you were old enough to remember shotgun weddings, <laughs> the vast majority of people when you got married, it was for better. I mean, you were happy, that was a happy day. Okay, I know there's exceptions, but the vast majority of people, the day you got married was not a sad day. It was a happy day, vast majority, okay? Even if some of you had a few questions in your mind, hey, it was a happy day in general. So, for better. That's not really that hard to vow to be faithful so it's for better, right? <laughs> but folks, if we're not careful, you know what we're really saying when we say our vows? We're saying for better, and I hope it's only for better. But what we're saying is for better, for worse. You see, I want you to understand something. When Jesus Christ laid down his life for us on the cross, do you know what he was saying to us? Do you know he knew every sin you'd ever commit? Did you know he knew how much you would fail him after salvation? Did you know he knew all the ways you were going to make him look bad as a Christian? All the ways you were going to grind his name into the mud? Do you know he knew all of the atrocities that different denominations were going to commit in history in the name of Christ? Do you know what he said? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for love, to cherish, till death to his father. Except it wasn't until death to his part because it's eternal, wasn't it? That part was different. So that's where your part's a little easier. You only have to do it for a few years, and then when you get to heaven, you're done. You're with Jesus Christ, and that's forever. All right? <laughs> but that's what Jesus was saying. He knew the for worse part. And he died for you anyway. He knew the problems you were going to cause him. And he died for you anyway. That was his commitment. To the church. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives submit yourselves to your husband because the church is subject to Christ. He knew. He knew. For better. So when you first get married, in general, it's for better. The good times. Oh, we love the good times. We all love the good times. But folks, there's gonna be good times, there's gonna be bad times. Even for Jesus Christ in his church, there are good times and there are bad times. And he's committed. So, folks, for better, for worse, we need to get this in our head. Oh, you know, people say this, well, I think God wants me to be happy. So I am not happy, so I need to get out of this marriage. Folks, no, no. God wants you to pay your vows. God wants you to pay your vows. And when you pay your vows, you are an example, and you are a picture of God's relationship, covenant relationship with us. God wants you to pay your vows. So that's for better. How about for worse? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Mr. Hansen probably could predict that for worse was going to be Genesis chapter 3. Right? It wouldn't be worse, wouldn't be chapter 2, and, and better would be chapter 3, right? So, <laughs> Genesis chapter 3 is when everything hit the fan, right? Okay, so Genesis chapter 3 and verses uh, 16 through 19. Don't have time to talk about it all, we're just talking about what relates to your vows. Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. If you study the construction of that and you compare it to the same phrase being used about Cain and sin in chapter 4 of Genesis, which I talked to someone about last week, but I don't have time to explain it here. What that, that phrase, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, what that phrase is referring to is the fact that she was going to want her own way and she's going to be dominated by her husband. That was part of the negative result of the fall. And uh, he says in verse 17, in verse 17, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. 
and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> I had that. <laughs> you can tell that when you got married, you wanted to live happily ever after, but you know what happened, don't you? At first it was for better, but then came pain and suffering and hardship and sorrow and children and work and, 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 and burdens and financial trials and bad attitudes and struggles of who's going to get their way. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Folks, that's the for worse part. That's why God said in his word, you got to stay till Mary till death do his part. Why did he say that? Because there was going to be a for worse. That's why he said, what God has joined together, let man not put asunder. Folks, if marriage was happiness and bliss, God would have to command you to stay married. <laughs> Think about it. You would just gladly stay married. The reason he commands you to stay married is because marriage is going to be hard. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult because we're both sinners. So that's the for better, and then there's the for worse. The for worse, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. You know, part of the for worse is more children. <laughs> that is, is, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. You know why? As children are a lot of work, and they will make you pull your hair out. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. That's the for worse. Folks, marriage is hard. And that's why at the altar you said for better, for worse, you didn't just say for better. The way we're all behaving now in the United States of America today is that it's only for better, it's not for worse. It's for better and it's for worse. And did you notice that God didn't say, you know, Adam, that, that woman really, you know, I mean, I know you're at fault because you sinned too, but how about we just get rid of Eve and get you a different wife? There weren't any other wives around. But, you know, Adam could have been like, you know, God, this, this marriage isn't really working out. It's only been a few hours, but it hasn't really been an hour, hour long. I don't know how long it's been out. A few days. This marriage really worked out very good. Um, anybody else out there? Could you? I got out of the rib. <laughs> but you know what God said? You're staying in that marriage even after you sin. You're staying in that marriage even uh, after you have to get chased out of the garden, you have to till the ground, and you have to sweat, and there is sickness and sorrow and pain and suffering and death, God says, you're staying in that marriage. God did not give Adam or Eve a way out of that marriage. Well, my husband wasn't really being the leader. If he had been the spiritual leader, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. That's what she could have said. So God, could you give me someone else? And he could have said, and he did say, that woman thou gave his name. But, you know, he could have said, you know, this woman, she's just, uh, she just, you know, she just kind of all fell apart on me and looked at me with those big brown eyes or whatever color her these eyes were. And then I, um, I just sinned. And, and what do I do? You know? And God's like, oh yeah, you're right. You know, let's find you someone else. No, for better, for worse. For better, it was wonderful. For worse, it was difficult. And God says, you're staying in that marriage. There's a reason, folks, why the marriage vows say for better, for worse. But now we need to go to for richer. Will you please turn over to Job chapter 1. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, Job's wife thought she had married a real keeper at first. <laughs> oh man, if you any of you would have wanted to be Job's wife, wait till I read about Job and what an incredible how wealthy he was. For richer. Nobody has trouble being married to someone who's richer. You know, it's not like you stood at the altar going for richer. Uh, well, I hope he doesn't make too much money. You know, I mean, I don't think a single woman that stood at the altar and said, you know, fifty thousand is enough. You know, seventy-five. I wouldn't want my husband to make seventy-five a year. Hundred thousand. Whoa, that'd be way too much. I wouldn't want to be married for richer. I don't think anybody did that. Okay. So richer's not a problem, but there are people who are married and they're wealthy and they enjoy it. But folks, not that doesn't always last. And that's not everybody's not going to have that lot in life. So Job 1, 1 through 3. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. By the way, that sounds like a good husband, doesn't it? Perfect and upright. <laughs> Fears God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. That's the multiplying by conception. And his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she, ashes, she asses <laughs> and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. So in other words, in that entire area where Job lived, he was the wealthiest man. He was almost kind of like, maybe he had a Trump Tower. I don't know, but he was wealthy. He was welcome. And you know what? That was probably pretty good, wasn't it? That's for richer. You know, you say for better, for worse. You're going to think about it. Why did they even put that in there? Yeah, maybe they should have took it, taken out for better, for richer, for health, 
Why don't we have better, richer, and health? Who, who says, I don't want to marry a healthy man? I don't want to marry a healthy woman. Well, I think it's in there for a contrast. He's saying for better, well, we all want better, or for worse. For richer, or for worse. Folks, some people do have perfect health their whole life until they die. Then it's not so good. But, but uh, some people are sick their whole life. Some people um, uh, are wealthy their whole life. They never have any financial troubles. But some people are poor their whole life. Isn't that true? And so that the wedding vows are describing the extremes in order to focus our attention on the fact that we're making a vow that no matter what the extremes of the circumstances, we will pay our vows. We'll keep our promise to God and to man. So for richer, but then let's just uh, turn a little bit down the page for the poorer part, right? He was very wealthy. He, like I said, he was very, very wealthy in his area. He was the greatest of all the men of the East. But now look, verses 13 through 21. Look what happened. And folks, this happens in marriage. This happens. There are marriages where everything is gone in one day. This happens, folks. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I alone am escaped only, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, you notice how the devil killed everybody except one person to go tell him what happened. Notice that's what the devil did. Um, and while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am and escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters, that sounds like they must have been hunters, because we always talk while someone else is yet speaking. <laughs> while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and I were working on that, by the way, so the Lord has convicted us of that. Um, <laughs> thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men. And uh, Alexander Scorby, when he reads this part, he puts the emotion here. And he says, Behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell me. Lost everything in one day, including his ten children. And Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, folks, there could be a time in your marriage where you lose everything. There could be a time in your marriage where you become homeless. Lose your house, everything. And you know what? You stay faithful, that person you married. For better, for worse. For richer, and for poorer. Do you know how many people made financial trouble the excuse for getting divorced? You know, I always think of when they say, well, my husband was so terrible with the finances, he spent it all away. Or my wife was so went crazy with the credit card and put us in all his debt, and then I couldn't handle the stress of it, so we got divorced. So you didn't say for poor? Can I see what your wedding vow said? You didn't say for poor? Oh, no, I only said for richer. Really? <laughs> well, I can tell you something. Job was the wealthiest man, and then he was the poorest man. And all happened in one, from, that, from Richard to in one day. And it can happen to you, and it can happen to me. Not one of us is so financially secure, we couldn't get wiped out one day. Just like Job, it can happen to you and me. And you know what God says? When everything is, when your family is wealthy, and your marriage, you're doing good, the paychecks are rolling in, the 401 is looking great, everything's wonderful, be faithful, pay your vows. But you know what? When you lose everything, and you're on the street, and you're homeless, and you don't have enough clothes on your back, food for your kids, you need to pay your vows. Because you made a vow, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Chapter 20, chapter 20, chapter 2 is where we get sickness. Do you notice that Job got sick, didn't he? Chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. I've had times where I've had several boils. I've had times where I had like three, four boils. Um, I had had boils on my head, my face, I've had it in, on, on my neck, I couldn't even move. I've had terrible boils, but folks, I can't even imagine having boils from the sole of my foot to my crown, my whole body covered with boils.
happened. You had this unbelievable pain that came in because you can't hardly move when your body's all swelled up from boils. And said his wife unto him, I'm out of here. I'm sick of this. I'm done. That's not what she said. She didn't propose to leave him, but she did propose him to do something that wasn't good to do. And that was just because she just couldn't handle the pressure. That was all. That was pretty normal for her to just fall apart. If you lost, before you criticize Joe's wife, I want you to lose everything you own in one day and all and, and, and ten of your children. And then come back and criticize Joe's wife, all right? We're not here to criticize Joe's wife tonight, wife today. All right? I'm not saying what she did was right, but I'm saying, hey, I think you should go through what you went through before you do that. And said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity, curse God, and die? And he said unto her, now listen to this. Did Job say to her, you know what? You are demonstrating that you are not at a level of spiritual perfection that I expected you to be by this stage in our marriage. And so I am out of this marriage. Is that what Job said? Nope. He said, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speak. And as Joe Arthur preached an excellent, excellent message called, Why Did Joe's Wife Say What He Said? I recommend it. It's on the internet. You can find the message. It's a great message. Why did Joe's wife say what he said? He, she said, <laughs> he pointed out, he pointed out that he did not say she was one of the foolish women. He said she was speaking as one of the foolish women. See, Job knew that his wife in that moment was falling apart emotionally. And he knew it wasn't really her. And men, I know this isn't the message, but men, and, how, and wives, you need to remember this too, because your husband will have his moments where he doesn't act like himself either. You need to learn how to recognize when your spouse is not really being themselves. They're being someone else. And you need to know who the real person is that you married, and you need to be strong for them until they can calm down and go back to being themselves again. Every single person in this room needs to hear that. That's important. And so he said, you're speaking as one of the foolish women. He didn't say she was a foolish woman. He said she was speaking like foolish women speak. And he said, um, I need to tell you something. We don't only receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not joke sin with his lips. Now listen, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness. I want to tell you something. It will come a day when you will get sick in your marriage. It will come a day when your spouse will get sick in your marriage. And you need to be very careful on that day that you don't let your anguish and your grief over pain and suffering and sickness to cause you to break your wedding vows. Because you made a vow, and God says, defer not to pay it. You need to keep your vows in sickness. And that's what happened in this passage. Job kept his vows in sickness. And his wife even kept her vows in sickness. Make sure that you don't allow your anguish and your pain and your grief to cause you to do something you regret the rest of your life. You vow in sickness and in health. And that's health is Job 42. Don't you love it when you read Job 1 and you get to skip all the way to 42? <laughs> There's a lot of confusion in between those chapters. But Job 42 and verses 10 through 17, that's in health. It's interesting that the wedding vows reversed that part. Instead of saying health and sickness, it's sickness and health. I don't know why I did that. It's probably just for effect so we can see the contrast that we're making. But um, in health, Job 42, maybe they were reading Job 1 42, and they said that sickness precedes health. No. Job 42, 10 through 17. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. He turned the captivity. You know what Job's captivity was? It was his sickness. So it's his sickness and in health. But then it also said the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren, all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had fourteen thousand sheep, and six thousand camels, and a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. He called the name of the first Jemima, the name of the second Keziah, the name of the third Karen Hapak. In all the land were no woman found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job 140 years. Well, he must have been old when he died. After this lived Job 140 years, and he saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of eight days. Do you realize that Job had that terrible sickness? And his wife could have abandoned him in that sickness? They could have had a whole falling out, and, and their marriage could have been over during that sickness. But you look later and see all the health and all the years, and guess what? He, she gave him ten more kids. 
And not only that, but he saw four generations after that. So folks, you need to be faithful in sickness and in health. Amen. In sickness and in health. There'll be time of sickness, time to be faithful. For better for worse, for richer for poor, in sickness and in health. And then the next one is this, to love. It's turn the Ephesians 5. Because when you said to love, you did not mean to feel warm, fuzzy feelings towards your spouse. You were not vowing to feel feelings. You were vowing to do some things. A vow is a vow of what you're going to do, not how you're going to feel. All right? Because nowadays we've changed the meaning of the word love. You know, I've taught on this. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice Amen. to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. That's what love is. And that's what it means when you say to love and cherish to its part. So to love. Ephesians 5, 25 through 30. Ephesians 5, 25 through 30. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Oh, let's just stop there. Jesus felt fond feelings and warm, fuzzy feelings of love toward the church. And so, husbands, you feel fond, warm, fuzzy feelings of love toward your wife. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, there's some things that Jesus did, and that was actually what he was doing when he loved the church. It's what he did. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know what Jesus did for the church? He died in the church. He literally gave up his life. He gave up every single thing he had for the church. That's what he did. That's what it means to love. Man, that's what you vowed. You vowed that you were going to lay down your life and all of your rights and all of your own happiness and all of your own desires. You were going to lay all that down for one reason, to take care of the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of your wife. That's what you vowed. You stood up at the altar. Well, Pastor Hunter, the pastor that married us, is a touchy feely, ear tickling kind of guy, and he never told me all that. Too bad. That's what the Bible says. So, at whatever point you figure out what the Bible teaches, then you got to do it. And that's what he, that's what you vowed to do, man. When you stood at the altar, that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. I've got a question. Pause. Do you feel warm, fuzzy feelings towards your body, men? I have never felt one warm, fuzzy feeling toward my body. Ever. I've never stood in the air and wow, I love that. I just I just want to stare at myself in the mirror all day. Ooh, look like a muscle. Mm, wow. I love my body. It's so, no, 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 folks. That's not what it's talking about at all. No feelings involved in this. It says, and by the way, folks, the Bible is so amazing because it explains itself right after it gives a command. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies is not talking about how you feel when you're right. It says this, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Okay, that, that what does that mean? You love your wife, you love yourself. I, I was thinking, why? Because... We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This is now bone of my bone, of flesh my flesh. Do you know that when you love your wife, you're loving yourself? You're loving your own flesh because your wife is one flesh with you. You're one. You're not two. You're one. Amen. He says this, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord of the church. That's a general statement. Folks, do you hate your own flesh? Like, do you, like, hit yourself and whip yourself and beat yourself and kick yourself and slam and, like, bang your head against the wall. Well, folks, we know there's like people who are more like demonically influenced to do things like that, but you know that in general, a normal human being, you don't hate your flesh. You take care of your flesh. If you start bleeding, you do something to stop the bleeding. If you uh, are sick, you go to the doctor or self-treat, whatever it is. You try to make yourself better. Um, you, If you're cold, you put on a jacket. Folks, you always love yourself when you take care of your body. That's what the Bible says. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. How do you take care of yourself? You feed yourself. Feed your neighbor. You clothe yourself. Clothe your neighbor. You do nice things for yourself. Do nice things for your neighbor. That's what the Bible means when it says, love your neighbor as yourself. No man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That's what you promised to do. Did you know that? Did you know that you never have a desire to divorce yourself from your own body. You don't go, I, I, right now I want to I wanna just like cut off a leg and cut off an arm. I, I just try to get rid of my body. No, you need your body. You, your body is you while you live on this earth. I know someday you'll get a new body in heaven. That's a separate subject. 
that your body is you. Men, your wives are you. Your one, your wives are you. And you promised when you said to love and cherish the Lord, you promised to take care of her needs the same as way as you take care of your needs. That's what you promised. It wasn't a feeling you were promising. You were promising to do something, to do some specific things. To love. But now women are commanded to love their husbands too. So I'm not going to leave women out here. This is uh, Titus. Please turn to Titus 2, 4 through 5. Titus 2, 4 through 5. Women are commanded to love as well. And women stood at the, at the altar, and they said to love and cherish as well. It wasn't just a man saying to love and cherish, but a woman says to love and cherish as well. Titus 2, 4 through 5. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now I want you to understand something. He didn't say that they may teach the young women to be sober, to feel warm, fuzzy feelings for their husband, to feel warm, fuzzy feelings for their children. I tell you, you know how to tell a woman to feel warm, fuzzy, fuzzy feelings for her children? Definitely, she already will. All right? But even her husband in general, she will have warm, fuzzy feelings for her husband in general. But the command is to love, which means to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of your husband. Did you know when you stood at the altar, ladies, and you said to love and cherish, go back to this part, you are promising to meet your husband's spiritual, emotional, and physical needs unconditionally till death be your mother. That's what you were promising. For better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and sickness and health, to love and then to cherish, please turn to 1 Corinthians 7. First Corinthians 7. This is to cherish. It is interesting to love and to cherish are treated separately in the wedding vows. And there is a different meaning of cherish. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. It's talking about meeting your, each other's physical needs, right? As husband and wife, okay? Um, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, likewise also the wife unto the, unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except that ye would consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, and Satan tempt you not, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And what that's referring to there is the fact that there is a physical oneness that happens in marriage. And you do not have power over your own body to refuse that physical oneness to your husband. And your husband does not have power over his own body to refuse that physical oneness to his wife. Okay? And that is more than just loving. That is cherishing. Because there's a closeness there in that relationship that's different than just living in the same house and being civil to each other. All right? There's a closer thing with that. And cherishing is really enjoying and enter into a really close and intimate relationship with your spouse. You said that you would cherish, and the Bible commands you to cherish one another. The Bible says that husbands and wives have physical needs to be physically one, and you cannot deprive each other of that. And by the way, and this is something I've said before, the Bible doesn't say it's only a need the man has. That is not taught in the Bible. Anywhere from just Revelation, it's not taught that it's only a need the man has. In fact, it says that the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife and husband. It actually says the husband's supposed to meet the wife's physical needs before it tells the wife to meet the husband. So all I'm clarifying with that is this. There is a need in marriage for that physical intimacy, and you you promise love and cherish the death do this part. If you're not cherishing your spouse, if you're depriving them of that physical intimacy, whether it's you, and I understand that, you know, you get old and things change, we're all going to die someday, all right? I get that. But I'm just referring to the fact that in general, if you're healthy, physically able, there is a um, there is a closeness that God has designed in marriage. And in fact, the wife has a need for that just as much as the husband. And in fact, the husband is given a command to make sure he's meeting the physical needs of his wife in this passage. To love and to cherish is not something you can withhold from them when you're mad at them. And it's not something the Bible says the only time you would actually withhold from them is if you both agree together and spend some time fasting and prayer. And just another subject, but fasting is, is, is um, neglecting the physical to attend to the spiritual. And that's why it refers to that in that passage. So to love and to cherish. Cherish is that extra level of closeness that God commands us to have in marriage. Without marriage, our marriage will not be healthy marriages. And then the last is this, till death do us part. Please 
uh, oh, stay in 1 Corinthians 7 and just drop down to verse 10, verses 10 and 11, till death do us part. Is that really biblical? Should we be changing the wedding vows till, till divorce do us part? After all, think about it. Sometimes your spouse chooses to divorce you and it wasn't your choice, right? So um, should we change it till the divorce do us part? We'd stop and think about it. When you said till death do us part and they said till death do us part, what if they break their wedding vows? Well, then you're parted by divorce. It's okay for you to go back and remarry, right? But wait, you said till death do us part. So if what you believe is that if your spouse abandons you, you have a right to remarry, then you shouldn't say till death do us part because your spouse isn't dead. Then what you really believe, and if you want to defend it from Scripture and say it's what you believe, and I know many pastors do try to defend that from Scripture, fine. But don't say till death do us part because you're not paying your vows. You made a vow till death do us part, and now you switched it to, well, what it really meant was if my spouse abandons me, then it's till divorce do us part. Well, then say till divorce do us part. Don't say till death do us part. But by the way, there's a reason why you said till divorce. Till death do us part, we're not switching it. There's a reason why. The reason you said it is because the Bible says it. That's why you said it. And you believed it when you first got married. But we like to change the word of God later to fit our circumstances. You know what that's called? Situation ethics. It's not in the Bible. Verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Who's talking here? God or Paul? Not I, but the Lord. God's talking. Out of there I command, yet not I, but the Lord. The Lord is giving this command. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Here's the command. Let not the wife depart from her husband. If she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. What is the clear command there? Till death do us part. If you depart, remain unmarried or else be reconciled to your husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Till death do us part. And there's one more part of that statement, and that's in Romans chapter 7. If you'll turn with me there. Romans chapter 7. I am aware of the time, folks, but I really want us to understand this because this is a very important subject. And if I divided this into smaller sections, there would be uh, some people, would not, not, not the same number of people in, in every, at church every Sunday, and some people would miss part of it. It's very important that you think about everything you vow, not just part of your vows. So that's why we have to go through this. We're just about done. Um, Romans chapter 7, verses 2 through 3. Here's the death part. Romans chapter 7. The other one is, don't depart. If you depart, remain unmarried, or else be reconciled. That's the one that's saying, don't depart and remain unmarried if you do depart. Here's the part that specifically mentions death. Romans 7, 2 through 3. For the woman, which hath an husband, is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he is nice to her. So long as he meets all her needs. So long as he is the knight in shining armor, she's not she married at the altar. <laughs> so long as he keeps his vows, then she keeps hers. No, folks, it says this. The woman with half and husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. As long as he's living, she's bound by the law to her husband. That's what she promised till death was part, not till the divorce was part. But if her husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Till death do us part. If her husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. If her husband be dead, she is free from that law. How do you get free from your wedding vows and, and from being married in God's sight? Till death do us part. It's very clear in the word of God. And folks, I don't have time to go into all the accepted before today, but I have taught on it. I'll be glad to talk to you later. I've never turned down a, an opportunity <laughs> to talk about the Word of God. You know, I'm not as scared of the subject. Talk, addressed it many times. But I want to tell you this, just as a thought for you. If you are saying that if your spouse breaks their wedding vows, then you get to break yours, you're saying you never meant yours. Do you understand? The Bible says defer not to pay it. You have to pay your vows. You say, well, maybe the vows are not matter. You make that vow. If you want to start a campaign, like some people want to do to say repeal the Second Amendment or something, if you want to make start a campaign to change wedding vows on based on your new understanding of Scripture, go right ahead. Now, you will answer to God if what if your interpretation of Scripture is wrong. If you want to start a campaign to change it, fine. But there's a reason why those vows are there, folks. Number one, you need to keep your vow because you made the vow and you said till death to this part. And by the way, you meant till death to this part. You just are thinking, questioning God's now because... 
Oh, we like the for better, but not the worse. We like the richer, we don't like the poor. We like the health. We don't like the sickness, right? And I'm not getting the love and the cherish, so I'm not going to love and cherish either. All right? That's what we all go through with human beings. The Bible says her husband be dead, she is loose from that law. The Bible teaches till death do us part. And you said till death do us part. And just because your spouse breaks their wedding vows does not mean that it's okay for you to break your wedding vows. The Bible says defer not to pay it. Did you vow till death divorce to his part or till death to his part? Your vows are not paid. Listen, till one of you is dead. I'm not telling you you're allowed to go kill your spouse. Right? You're not. <laughs> your vows are not paid till one of you is dead. All right? Pay your vows. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Now I want you to listen to this. Your children are counting on you to be faithful. Your spouse is counting on you to be faithful. Your friends are counting on you and watching you, and they will be influenced by you if you're faithful. Your relatives are counting on you to be faithful. Your co-workers are watching you. They're counting on you to be faithful. Your Savior, who gave his life for the church, he's counting on you to be faithful. He wants to tell you someday, well done, my good and faithful servant. He wants to tell you that he's counting on you Pay your vows. Pay your vows. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a hard subject to talk about. But Father, I just know that years ago you put this as a burning burden on my heart. And from time to time, I feel led of you to share this. Father, there have been some things that have happened in this church that make it harder for me to preach this. But Father, you, you laid on my heart to preach this message before even a lot of these things happened, and even recently, and even just who shows up today in church, and all these different things going through my head. And Father, I know I already felt you wanted me to share this message this week after my anniversary on Monday. And so, Father, I believe that your Holy Spirit was leading and guiding, orchestrating when, which Sunday I would actually preach this message. And none of this is an accident. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit would move in our midst. And, Father, I myself need to be reminded of these vows because we often have conditional love for our spouses and you've commanded us to have unconditional love for one another. So, Father, I pray that this truth that is being so destroyed and so distorted and so ignored, even in many Bible-believing churches, that, Father, you would impress it on our hearts that the seriousness of this moment today would not be lost on us, that we would see that the rest of our lives and even many future generations are being shaped by our obedience to the vows that we have made. And I pray, Father, that you would impress that on us and that we would see the importance of it and that you would give us the grace to do it. And Father, I pray that every single person here, regardless of what they have done in their past, that they will make a commitment today to say, I'm going to pay my vows from now onward. I will pay the vows that I made. And so if you're here today, and regardless of your past, anything you've done in your past, if you're here today and you listen to this message and you said, I agree, I, I don't believe this is the pastor's opinion. I believe the word of God very clearly teaches, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do his part. I believe it's in the Bible. And if that's your response, that you, your response is that you don't just think this is my opinion, but you really see that this is truly stated in the Word of God, and this is what God wants us to do. And that the Bible clearly says, pay your vows. And you can go back in your mind and remember when you first made your wedding vows, and that someone that's still alive today, that you are still married to today, that you will say, make this commitment in your heart to God. Just pray something like this in your heart to God. Just say, God, I stood in the altar. And I made a vow till death do us part. And God, you said in your word, pay your vows. And so God, right now, I am renewing my vows. And I am saying, God, I said till death do us part, and I meant it. And I will keep the vows that I made till death do us part. That's your commitment to the Lord. I would really encourage you. If with every head bowed and every eye closed, you raise your hand right now. I would really encourage you. Maybe you can put your hand down. All you single people, I didn't see your hands. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I thank the Lord for the response. And the response isn't for me. It's for God. It's for his kingdom. 
And Father, we need that so badly today. Oh, Father, I pray you bring a great revival. I pray that Dells Baptist Church would always stand for biblical marriage. And I pray, Father, that this community would be transformed because we made a decision on April 28th, 2019, that we were going to be faithful to death to this point. Day and vows. Day and vows. Be with us this week, Father. Give us strength for the battle that we all have to face in Jesus' name.